parish base uh, to being a, f a major force in, in a lot of rural communities. Um, I, uh, um, uh, I, I think the school is still a crucial issue. And uh, one of the things that uh, amazes me is, is that there is a, you know, a lot of um, you know, imperative talk about you know, Catholics or, or, or the, 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 the tyranny of the Catholic school. And, um, and, and, and for you know, non-believers or, or multi-believers, how they are forced uh, uh, into uh, pretending to be Catholic. Um, and, uh, and that argument comes, I think, from you know, urban secular cosmopolitans. I don't find it so much, and particularly when I was doing the, the interviews, um, there's not the huge drive. I mean, the, the, you know, there's no a huge social movement about getting the church out of education in Ireland. There's not, particularly in rural areas, I don't see any kind of, uh, you know, uh, huge urgency, because um, there's been an adaptation. But the school is still, even you know, you know, Mary Corker and her colleagues found that the school was the linchpin of, uh, the, and that the, the church was becoming more peripheral. But Likewise, I think the GAA. Now, um, uh, you know, if when they go, uh, but yeah, look, I, I, I'm, I'm going to shut up because I have no idea what it is, except for my, you know, my, my research, of, of what it is to um, uh, to live in. Uh, although I, I, I have to, I'm, I'm, as part of my next project is is to go and look at that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jennifer. Um, Tom, I was wondering how you feel about the ethical and moral weight of your work when it translates into the public domain. Um, it's something I've always been interested in about that kind of fine line between research that might be activist in some way or another um, and, you know, the research that, that does translate. Very few academic pieces of work translate as much as yours have. So when you're writing for a public audience and you're, you're creating a new narrative of Irish identity and how we should feel about being Irish, or at least reconceptualizing it, how does that sit with you, like the, the responsibility, I suppose, of rewriting that for Irish people? Um, well, as I said, it, 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 it came from uh, uh, you know, the struggle with moral monopoly was, uh, was you know, definitely trying to skin this cat in a different way. Uh, but, but then going out and working you know, with women, um, and I got very interested or involved in action-oriented research because um, I, I started you know, to publish articles and, but also reports about what was happening in these working class areas uh, with these working class women who were literally you know, being comatose by doctors, giving them um, you know, drugs uh, to get them over their depression, their sense of alienation. And adult education was, was, was a means by which they, they began to think differently. But I, 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 when I was writing about that, um, uh, I realized that there was this thing called action-oriented research. And it was, again, that kind of threw back in thing that you know, the point is not to write uh, and explain the word, but to change it. And certainly for these women, um, you know, I had to do things whereby I had to write a report that was in that they wrote, and I helped them write. And then I went off and, and wrote my academic article or whatever in a different language. But it, it, that was negotiated. They refused. They wanted ownership and control of what was written about them and how they would write about it. And so then I wrote about how a you know. Um, uh, uh, adult educators had to make sure when they were writing academically that they weren't part of uh, the symbolic domination of the people that they were writing about. Um, and it, it, one of the amazing thing is that the, you know, the most quoted article uh, that I have written is Eman Empowerment and Emancipation, which is published in the American Journal of Sociology. It has the most citations by far of any of my work. But I, I, I left that uh, world of adult education. Um, uh, but yes, I, it, it, if it wasn't, you know, there's no point in writing *Moral Monopoly* or, and it, if it isn't about 
uh, trying to add to people's emancipation rather than subtract from it. Kira? Um, can I take you back to an image that you had in the early part of your conversation about the girl from Longford with her rabbit? Yeah. And I think that's interesting methodologically, right? Because you've been saying about suffering from the tyranny of, uh, you know, you can't uh, generalize from the particular. And you can actually turn that around and, and say, for instance, well, actually, the universal is always found and can only be found, as it were, through the particular, right? So yeah. there's something interesting then about something like that. You said this was a person who uh, had you had difficulty communicating through yep. with, maybe, and so on and so forth. And then you found that uh, she had this relationship with her rabbit that was interesting. Yeah. That made her happy. Um, now, okay, so there's two things, I think, going on in that. One is the methodological dimension of how important it is to find that small way in yeah. from which you can get at something like the meaning of life. Yeah. But there's another dimension to them, which is like, um, <clears throat> she's happy with that, uh, and this is how she lives her life. She has something important going mm. on with her rabbit and so on and so forth. But she's not just living that, she's also, as where there's some higher value contained in that relationship. Uh, so it would be really interesting then to kind of explore that and say, well, in what way is that, um, is, is, is some higher value that gives her life some meaning, as it were, uh, uh, to be located or to be uncovered or to be unconcealed from the mundane uh, story of her care for her rabbit. But I'm, I'm, maybe yeah. I've given it away there by saying something like, so it's not just simply that she, you know, what, what does it mean to pet something, for instance? Or what does it mean to feed something? Or what does it mean to take care okay. of something? You know, okay, sorry. No, no, it, and, and, and that's, you see, I can't remember her name. Yeah. And I interviewed her, and, um, you know, I go into this in the appendix. Yeah. Um, and I think I take her as an example. Some people, you know, for the, mainly the interviews asked about three quarters of an hour to an hour. During that time, one person I asked, uh, I think it was 60 questions, which may not mean them, but I asked her something like 300. So, you know, tell me more about that, tell me, you know, because she didn't have the ability to talk about herself. And, uh, but I, I felt it imperative, you know, that, you know, that being able to talk was not reason why you would be excluded. And, um, so, I was, I was going to, and I, I talked to her about her rabbit, and then suddenly in the interview there was a silence. And it turned out that she'd been working in a shop in Longford, and her boss had committed suicide uh, a year ago, a year previously. And you know, she was a young woman going into work, everything was hunky-dory, and then suddenly her boss hung himself. And she withdrew uh, into the rabbit, into her, herself, and the rabbit became her mechanism of grieving. Now, so that, but I, you know, I only scratched the surface, I only approximated, yeah. but um, uh, I remember when I, suddenly her reticence, her, you know, and, and what it was then was that um, obviously her parents, and, but um, her whole thing was going into Longford Town and uh, meeting up with her friends and then coming back to the house and then back to a rabbit. So she was, she was engaging in this, she was, she was getting out now, and she had access to her parents' car, and she was hoping to get involved in childcare. Um, but uh, you know, at one level, she was structurally, she was a um, you know, no third level education qualifications. She was living with her parents. It was, you know, you know, the recession was kicking in, uh, and you know the likelihood of her making it out of there were very little. so. And yet, uh, you know, I thought that the rabbit was actually, the, but then it turned out there was this tragedy in her life, uh, and but she had not talked to anybody about it. I mean, I, I, so I, I, I can't say that definitively, but it seemed that she hadn't talked to her parents. <coughs> and that she'd gone into silence. Um, now, it was quite extraordinary that she was willing to talk to me. Now, whether she thought that I would be somebody would be able to help her, or she misunderstood what my role is, I have no idea. I think the, um, 
heavens have been very kind of kind to yeah. us with the sunshine for the period of the uh, period of the interview and I think the heavens are giving us a message that they're about to be less kind to us so I just like to take the chance before it really comes down so thank you very much Tom Inglis for a really kind of fascinating interview thank you